Turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes <clears throat> chapter number three. This is a passage of scripture that will uh, serve as our final message for 2023 and prayerfully uh, uh, opportunity for us to start uh, on offense, if you will, into 2024. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is uh, known in the biblical text as a book of wisdom. It is one of several texts in uh, the Torah, the uh, Jewish scriptures, certainly in the uh, Christian scriptures, we regard these, these words to be a powerful reflection. Some people attribute this wisdom, these series of reflections that have become canonical, if you will, that have been included in the sacred text. Some view them as reflections of Solomon, uh, the, the king who was uh, one of the last kings of the United uh, uh, Tribes of Israel, and some attribute all of these words to him. Uh, other scholars attribute it to a, a collection of wisdom sayings that were known uh, both in the uh, country and the culture of Israel, but also perhaps in the region of the the ancient uh, Palestine, Israel, Middle East uh, area. Nevertheless, what is great about wisdom is that it always outlasts people. Amen. Uh, there are so many, I was watching last night, I don't know how I started watching, oh, it came up on my reels, I was watching uh, uh, Michael Jackson and his 19, was it 83 when he performed uh, Beat It for the first time, not Beat It, uh, Billy Jean, and he did his moonwalk. That was 1983, was that 1983? And it was just like a, 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 a um, you know, amazing performance. I did not see it live because, you know, in 1983, my parents uh, were very uh, strict holiness people. So we couldn't even watch Michael Jackson, listen to him, because they were telling us the way he was moonwalking was because there was spirits that was carrying him. <laughs> Just tell you what kind of holiness people we were, praise God. So I, I had experienced Michael Jackson in, in late into my teens, praise the Lord. But uh, I was experiencing Michael Jackson last night uh, while I was deep, you know, praying about this sermon. Amen. And uh, in the comments, there was a great comment that said, you know, uh, timeless uh, contributions by human beings always outlive the human being themselves. And I was just thinking about that when, when, when in relationship to these particular verses that we will read out of this wisdom writer because we may not always know the origin of wisdom, but we do know that what makes it wise is that it outlasts the giver. And as we move into a new year, as we move into a new season, uh, I want you to be mindful that we are a people who live in time, but we are not limited to the wisdom of our time. We may live in 2023 going into 2024, but there is this timeless principle. There is nothing new under the sun which just means that whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever you will go through, there is grace, wisdom, and faith for you. Hmm. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, there's some for me, there's some for me. You don't have to wonder, is my experience of life so beyond the scope and scale of what other people are going through, that surely I need some special kind of intervention. Some of you may, praise God, no, just wait. According to Michael McBride, that may be true, but according to the timeless wisdom and power of God, how many of you know there's nothing too hard for God? No circumstance you've gone through in 2023 that has been too hard for God. 
How many feel like it may have been hard for me for some time, amen? But the fact that you're still here, maybe it's just a little bit of a hint that God is giving us what we need to survive. And you don't have to live your whole life in survival mode. I do think there are moments where God will give you a chance to thrive. And that is part of what we'll talk about today. Simply, uh, the title of the sermon will be, What Time Is It? Mm-hmm. I knew somebody was going to say gang time. I'm going to wait for the oof. All you sports fanatics, of which I am one, praise God. Ecclesiastes chapter number three is where we'll head. Uh, this is uh, a powerful, powerful, common passage in the lectionary. This uh, passage is given to us uh, as the passage for New Year's Day. Technically, we are still in the season of Christmas. Amen. Christmas, though celebrated last Sunday and the day fell in the course of this week, it's important to appreciate that Christmas as a liturgical practice is several weeks long. Amen. And, you know, it is not that Jesus was born in December. Amen. We, we, hopefully we pass that argument and conversation. It is that the church decided that in order for us to be reminded of this great uh, collapsing of time and sacred space, we worship and acknowledge this time. And so this lectionary passage is a powerful passage. I may refer to the lectionary passages in the Christmas uh, division as well, uh, if I have time and don't uh, be too verbose and long-winded. So y'all pray, amen. Ecclesiastes chapter number three. Uh, I think it should be on the screen, all right? And the words of the scripture say this, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Verse number six, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Verse 9, what do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. God has made everything beautiful in its time. God has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Whew. Now that's a philosophical mind bender. Amen. I spent some time reading that 10 times trying to know what? I got eternity in my heart, but can't fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Eternity is in your heart, but you can't fathom. I want you just to, you know, I don't mean to mess with you, and I'm going to, you know, just try to remember the world before you were here. And at the same time, imagine the world after you leave here. While you hold the world that you know right now. 
the, the writer is saying that eternity is in our heart, but only God knows. Mm, that thing, you know, kept me up for a little while. But I'm not preaching on that today, so you ain't got to worry about it. Verse number 12, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. We are going to speak again from the topic, what time is it? Bless the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes the preaching and the teaching easy. And we'll say thank you so we may grow thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Time is for all intents and purposes, both a concept, but also for many, it is a prison. For we know that we have calendars and we have clocks, and we as people, particularly who live here in the Bay Area, we've heard it say many, many times that time is money. And I can't be wasting my time that we are driven and dominated by clocks and calendars. Uh, and for many of us who would like to live in time rather than on time, it really kind of, you know, sometimes it, it aligns with your personality type. I don't know if you ever met someone who does not care that much about being on time. And you're trying to be in a Relationship could be work, could be friendship, could be family, could be romantic, all kind of relationships, and you want to be on time, but they want to live in time. Living in time means that, you know, hey, what's, you know, I'm just going to show up, you know, in time. In time for what? In time for me to get there. <laughs> and you somebody be like, hey, we said we're going to meet at three. Well, come on, let's, let's show up on time. And it's so interesting because we should appreciate that this notion of time is less than 300 years or so old. That, you know, wasn't until maybe, oh man, 15th century, so maybe 500 years old. It's, it's, it's relatively modern that the overwhelming period of humans living on this planet did not seek to fill up every minute of their day with tasks. They were largely moving related to the sun being up and the sun being down. They had a notion of time that was not about Filling every moment with activity, but having purpose within the framework of the time allotted to them. And as we think of 2024, I want you to imagine what does it look like for us to reclaim a concept of time? I'm certainly not inviting you to, uh, you know, Embrace the end time living on your job, whereby it may cost you your job. I want you, you know, I heard Pastor Mike say, I ain't got to show up on time. I'm going to tell your boss, I ain't got to show up on time because we only been doing this for 500 years. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going back to another, no, I don't want you to do that, praise God, because I can't pay your mortgage or your bills or your cell phone, whatever. No, you show up on time. But I would love for you to reclaim parts of this idea of being in time as it relates to the parts of you that only you can manage as a gift from God to steward. 
And could it be, beloved, that as we think through 2024, that there is an invitation for us to come out of this year appreciating that for all of the activities we wanted to do, for all of the assignments we sought to keep, we are leaving 2023 with still some things left undone. That there is never a time in your life where you exhaust everything. That this idea that you and I have to make the most of every moment as a means of production is part of the Western capitalistic Protestant work ethic that is literally destroying our lives. That there is a reason why we ought to have Sabbaths built into our time. There is a reason why you ought to take a break. There is a reason why you ought to sleep. Hello, somebody. There's a reason why you ought to laugh. There's a reason why you ought to find some joy that you and I are not machines, inanimate objects that are intended to just grind away at life because time is ticking. No, perhaps the wisdom writer is giving you and I a lifelong reflection. Now it's important to say about what we've read today uh, that the text, biblical text in particular, is often read by many as a series of prescriptive commands which is just to say that if the Bible says it, then that settles it. And everything the Bible says is true. And I just got to take it at face value. And while there, you know, may be some room for that literalist interpretation, I want you to know that for the overwhelming majority of Christian, before that Jewish interpretation, Scripture was not intended to be taken literally in that way. There are interpretive tools. There are lens in which we are to read text. You ought to read the text almost like an encyclopedia. How many remember what encyclopedias are? All right, not Britannica, not, no, not Britannica. What's, what's the thing? Yeah, Britannica. What's the thing? Wikipedia. Not that, because you don't, you don't get... You don't get the same experience from a Wikipedia, you see. Because Wikipedia, you still just looking at a screen and you go in there and you go for what you're looking. If you don't know what to look for, you still won't find it. But my mom and them got Encyclopedia Britannicas. And it was all kind of things up there. And, 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 and stuff I didn't even know I needed to know was up there. And it would have all these. We got to do something about, about how, how, do, how, how do we help one another learn and know things that we don't know we need. Oh, my time is leaving me. Lord, help me today. But the, the point I'm trying to say is that Scripture should be seen as more like an encyclopedia and not like a prescriptive list of commands. There are genres in the text that are historical, meaning they're just trying to tell you a story. There are some that are wisdom sayings, we're reading one a day. There are some that are Deuteronomy, or they are a legal framework for a social societal structure for the people named and called Israel back in pre-modern <laughs> uh, times, not the Israel today that just started in 1947 because of a Zionist vision that came out of the Balfour Declaration in Europe in the aftermath of the Holocaust. They don't even follow that. Right. So 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 part of this means that in order to really understand 
the best application of these texts, you kind of need to be in a community of people who have held an interpretive kind of, kind of history and narrative and lens so we can all discern this stuff together well. And the biblical text we've read today is not prescriptive. The wisdoms of scripture are not prescriptive. They are descriptive. Which just means that they are attempting to tell you what time has taught them. And I want you to know, beloved, that history and time is a great teacher if you are willing to sit at their feet. Because, uh, you know, there are some things that I would rather learn from somebody else's hard knock degree. I don't need to learn everything from the school of hard knocks. If you got a knot upside your head, I'd rather learn how you get that knot upside your head. Mm -hmm. Rather than me running up against that brick wall and then I get the knot upside my head. No, uh, I love your knots because you made it through your knots. And so I wanna learn from your knots so I don't have to get those same knots. But please understand, there are knots waiting for you. Mm -hmm because none of us escape the knots. But there is wisdom that comes from learning life's lessons. A French composer, Hector Berlioz, says that time is a great teacher. Unfortunately, it kills all its pupils. Some heavy things. Things that just make you go, hmm. But what I love about time as well is that it also teaches us. This particular passage gives us 28 arrangements of descriptive life events. And I want to suggest to you that the fool cannot discern between what time it is. And so they treat every time like it's the same time. How many of you know that every season of your life ought not be treated the same? Now, you know, we who live in California, particularly the Bay Area, we are a people who have been robbed of seasons. You know, we have in the Bay, sunny but cold, rainy but cold. We don't have snow in the Bay. We go drive <laughs> four hours to go see some snow and just flop around in it. Ooh, you know? Ooh, this is so fun. You're falling in it, doing snow, snow things. But if you were living in the Midwest, Detroit, Chicago, Flint, Lord have mercy. Ain't nobody out there. <laughs> nobody. You understand? I went on some justice work and I told them people, you better make sure justice is done in the fall. <laughs> and in the summer, if you need McBride there. Because this winter for this Cali boy, is not the will of God for my life. And I do mean that now. I stay home, I stay out of Chicago, I stay out of Flint, at St. Louis, I went there during Ferguson, it was the summer, we was protesting for Michael Brown, you know, uh, we young, we old, we marching all night long, we, we just, we, we protesting. Uh, August, good, September, good, October, okay, November, ooh, got a little cold, Thanksgiving, the hawk, they call it the hawk swept through. I said, I'm going home, praise God. And it was called perfect timing. <laughs> so we're robbed of seasons. But while I was there, you know, my, in my new experience, I would show up in the Midwest in the winter with my winter California clothes on. I even had a trench coat that I bought from Burlington, showing up in the Midwest, thinking I'm gonna be warm. 
not realize they even make clothes differently in California than they do in the Midwest. I could not dress for winter seasons the same way even in our own country. Every season of your life cannot be deemed the same. If we lack, here's my first point, discernment to appreciate what time is it and what is required of me given the time in which I am living, you may show up in some swimming trunks or a bathing suit in the middle of a snowstorm. And while you may have clothes on, it is not enough. Me and my daughters have these conversations all the time because, you know, they believe they should be able to wear whatever they want to wear. Anywhere, you know, anywhere. It's just, you know, daddy's just clothes. I should be able to wear pajamas to school. I should be able to wear, you know, uh, Crocs in a, 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 a storm with water all on the ground. Like, yeah, wear, wear shoes with holes in it. <laughs> and it became such a struggle. I'm talking about like broke down emotional crying stuff. I said, okay, just wear what you want to wear. Don't call me to come pick you up though. Hey man, you trash through them puddles <laughs> with them open whole shoes. <laughs> and hopefully you'll learn some wisdom. Mm -hmm. The kind that time only teaches you along the way. I'll come and pick them up though anyway, cause you know, they're my girls and uh, you know, I, I let them get a little wet, but not drenched. <laughs> get in a car, oh, daddy, I'm so wild. I know, ain't, ain't life hard. Next time, put you on some shoes, Air Force Ones, put on anything. But the, 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 the discernment needed for us to make sure that we understand that there is a time to be born. Descriptive, not prescriptive, and a time to die. People be like, oh, see, the Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. So we don't have to weigh in on anything that relates to a time to die because that's just the will of God for people to die. No, that's not what the text is saying. The text is saying that if I look at life from the beginning to end, I observe that you and I cannot escape this writer says at least these 28 experiences. You can do everything right in your life and you're still gonna have to deal with what? A time to embrace <laughs> and a time to keep from embracing. You don't got that kind of game, bruh. We're just gonna be all lovey-dovey all the time. You don't got that kind of money, homie. Well, you gonna be stacking it all your life. There is a time for everything under the heavens. The discernment needed by us as followers of Jesus is how must I live in light of this time? Everybody say discernment. First thing. The next thing that I think the scripture lifts up that you and I should hold as we go into 2024, leaving 23, is that time always is informed by our faith, our faith in God, our faith in the Almighty, our faith in the activity of one who is greater than us. We are just coming through the miracle, the season, the celebration of Christmas. I love uh, what, what, what Howard Thurman, he's a Christian mystic. This is what he says, that when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, all of these were characters in the Christmas story, when all those miracles, those events are done, Howard Thurman says the work of Christmas begins. And what is the work of Christmas? To Lord, I can't even read. To find the lost. Somebody say the work of Christmas. To heal the broken. Somebody say the work of Christmas. To feed the hungry. 
to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. This is the work of Christmas. Leave this up for a second because I, I want us to appreciate that faith flowing from our relationship with God through Christ gives us a resume, a job description, if you will. Your resume, if you look over your year, should have some of these things on 2023. If you're doing the work of Christmas. The work of Christ coming. Remember the incarnate, Christ showing up, Christ being made flesh. We, if no one else in the world, this is why it's so important for we who follow Jesus to appreciate that if no one else does it, there ought to be somebody in the earth, earth, sorry, (laughs) earth, the earth, who is doing the work of Christmas. Oh, Pastor Mike, why y'all so hung up on justice? That's the work of Christ. Why are you so hung up on what's happening in other nations? Ain't you American? No. Well, yeah, maybe sometimes, yes. I just happen to be born here. And, and there are benefits to being American. Just like in the text, there was a benefit to being a Roman. Paul was a Roman. So he can go anywhere in the Roman Empire and pretty much be protected because nobody wanted to take the life of a Roman. Privileges to being a Roman. There's a privilege being an American, but my life is not limited to just the benefits of American sensibilities. We are a part of a global church. Do you understand what that means? That means that if it's happening in a whole nother country to someone who's a follower of Jesus, we got a right to show up and ask ourselves, are we doing this work? Is this work happening? I speak out about Palestine, not just because I am a lover of justice, but there are Palestinian bishops, pastors, Christians, churches that I've hung out with over there. And there's some Muslim folks, and there's some Jewish folk that I know and love. So I I love all of humanity, but there's a unique responsibility we have that if no one else is advocating for peace in the world. As a follower of Jesus, you can't be a warmonger and be a follower of Jesus. I mean, you can try, but the scripture should cause you to feel uncomfortable. Mm Mm-hmm. You can't love Jesus, say, I follow Jesus, and you out here hating people. I hate you to be like Jesus, to be, no, no, it don't work like that. You can't be a thief robbing from the poor, robbing from the marginalized. You and I have to appreciate that our faith must inform every season. How does this relate to the sermon and to the 28 cycles we saw in this passage? It means that I may not be able to determine what season I'm in. I may not even be able to determine what season is coming, but I can determine how I show up. In every season, I can show up to find the lost. I could be rich, I could be broke, I could still be showing up to find the lost. I could be a business owner, I could be unemployed, I can be a mid-manager, but I can show up to help heal the broken. How does your faith require you to show up? And then the last thing I'll say is we must have intentionality. Well, there's two more things I'll say. Let me do this one thing before intentionality. Balance. That is very important because I am someone who lives out of balance. I'm not, I'm not proud, I'm not like, you know, proud of it, like popping my car. I, no, I'm someone who, who, there's a scripture in the text that, that I, 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 I internalized in probably not a healthy way where the scripture says, uh, Paul says, I have been arrested by this gospel. 
which means that I have a zeal. I have this insatiable appetite and drive to do the work of God at all costs. But my body won't let that happen. My relationships won't let that happen. My money won't let that happen. Life won't let that happen because, again, time is not intended to be exhausted in that way. How many of us know that being a workaholic is actually a sign of a lack of faith? Lord, save me from myself. I be praying that. My prayer, Lord, just save me. Save me from myself. Because I be thinking, if I don't do it, it ain't going to be nothing. And you know why I think that way? Because I work with some people. Well, I have. Nobody presently. Nobody in my, no, I have. <laughs> work with people who don't want to work. <laughs> I don't, why do you have a job? And you don't want to work. You want the money. You want the holidays. You want the benefits. You want the sick leave. You want the dental. You want the health insurance. No work. Why? Go work for yourself. Then you can have all of what you want based off of what you've done. No, but you come into my space where I am working to make sure every time there's an automatic deposit in your bank account, there's some money that shows up according to what we contracted. Every time you need to go to the hospital, you know, I'm just testifying, venting. <laughs> Let me go back to my point. Balance. <laughs> Verse number 12 says, this is a powerful observation from a wisdom writer that God deemed in God's will to be communicated to us over time. Verse 12, I know there is nothing better for people to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil this is the gift of God. That is a word for all of us in here who are workaholics, high achieving folk, people who were told that if you don't do it, it just ain't gonna get done. People that were told, you know, you got to wake up, work, go to sleep, exhausted from work, work seven days a week, don't take no time with your family, don't take no time with your kids, don't take your time for yourself, don't laugh, don't, don't just work, no. The wisdom writer is telling you that there's time in your life. You must create for balance. And I got news for you. When you don't build balance into your life, your body breaks down and forces you to rest. Did you know that? You ain't just going to walk around here. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to work and ain't, and never going to get tired. No, you gonna get tired. Your body going to be like, ah! And, and, and when you are laid down in the green pasture, as I like to call it, <laughs> the scripture says, he makes you to lie down in a green pasture. You understand what that means? <laughs> he maketh, use the King James Version, he maketh me to lie down in a green pasture. That means he's giving you a timeout. And guess what? The world keeps going. The world don't stop because you lay down in a green pasture. Now, when you come back, you may have to pick, do you know, but that's where your faith in God and the people around you have to kick in. Balance. Somebody holler balance. Balance is important for us to declare and discern what time it is. And then the final thing I'll say to you and I is intentionality. Oh, boy. We at The Way have been wrestling for some time on what does it mean to be intentional in how we disciple seekers of God, followers of Jesus, 
the communities that we are called to steward. And we have for several years been pulling together this idea that we called the DNA of the way. We started it back in 2019, I think. And then the blip happened, I mean COVID. And we, 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 we lost three years, four years of our lives, being quarantined, going through transitions, trying to get our rhythms back. We were having a meeting this past week, our leadership team, and we were thinking about what does 2024 look for us? If we were to do a vision board, if we were to, 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 to project our greatest aspirations, our greatest core values, what would that look like? And we said we must be people who are able to declare with intentionality who we intend to be. Because who we intend to be in many respects is who we will end up being. And so we recovered some some of our core values. The first is Jesus. It's people of the way, we following Jesus. You're not following McBride. You're not following Hare Krishna. You're not following all, anyone else. They all may have great value, but we follow Jesus. So Jesus is a core value with intentionality. We are people who embrace justice. Because I do believe that as it's been popularized by Michael Eric Dyson, Cornell West. You know, it had to be a few who said it first. So I let them argue about that. But justice is what love looks like in the public. So following Jesus requires me to then have love in public spaces. And I can't just follow Jesus and just love myself while the whole world is literally crumbling around me. De-churchify was the third thing we said. De-churchify. Some of you may be familiar with decolonize, but you know, de-churchify feels more relevant for the church. That just means that there are some things that we do in church that we don't have to keep doing if they do not build up the Jesus, justice, love ethic of both our people and our institutions. So there's some things you got to unlearn. How many know there's some things you, you got to unlearn? Like, you know, one example, D-Church 5, talked about Michael Jackson earlier. Like, we really thought Michael Jackson was kind of like had to deal with the devil, you know? It was D-Church 5. Michael had no deal with the devil. He was a talented musician, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of our modern times. I, don't, I know no musicians before him. I'm sure there was somebody real good over in Timbuktu somewhere that was doing probably all the cock blocking everything Mike Jackson doing, he's probably doing it better. <laughs> but we only see Mike. Somebody say man. <laughs> so I'm sure somebody played better than Jordan. Somebody played better, you know, box better than Ali. You know, there, there's, a, there's some greatest of all times, but that is largely relative to what you and I have seen. Same way with the church. We are part of a historical Thousands of years breathing body of Jesus followers. So we got to lean in to our tradition, hold on to the things that are essential, and hold lightly the things that may be preference, but not necessarily determinative. Now, you know, all of us got preferences. I prefer the 49ers win today. Some of you prefer the Raiders win any day, right? <laughs> it's a preference. The world is not going to end. Well, it may end if the Niners don't win the Super Bowl. <laughs> It'll end for me. I'll be devastated. You know, when my teams lose, I don't even watch the sport for at least three months. I, I just can't, I can't watch sports and I can't do nothing. I just, just, just be devastated. I ain't got nothing to do for three months. Just, just. And someone, some of my friends said, I, they, I love it for you that you're so emotional about these sports teams. Because I thought you was only emotional about defeating white supremacy. It's like, I'm glad you. <laughs> so I don't know if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> Jesus, justice, the churchify. And the fourth thing is belonging. Four principles, values of the way with intentionality. And I want to offer to you, beloved, that as we move from this season 
2023 to the next season, are you asking yourself, what time is it? What time is it? There was this powerful, powerful poem that I read in my study. I put it up here on the screen. I'm going to invite us to read it in a second, but I want to offer us an opportunity to start to prepare ourselves for something we do here at The Way regularly on the last Sunday of the year. We did this a lot before COVID, I think almost every year. Haven't done it since COVID because we haven't really been in service together, but we're going to bring it back today. It'll take less than five or 10 minutes. So if you don't mind just hanging out with us for a few minutes longer. But we appreciate that there are, as I stated, some things that we intended to do in 2023 that are left undone. Or, and we acknowledge there are some things that happened in 2023 that we don't want to carry with us into this next season. And we acknowledge that there are some things coming on the horizon in 2024 that we want God to bless. And so there's a practice in, again, many religious traditions, Christian faith, not as much in the West, but certainly in other parts of Christendom, if you will, they make altars and they burn candles, they write requests. If you were to go over to the Holy Land, you'll see the Welling Wall and people write prayers on paper and they put it in the wall and they pray and they leave it there as a concrete expression of their aspiration. When I went to Egypt and I was trying to hike up Mount Sinai, I couldn't make it all the way up because I was out of shape, but they had altars all along the way, little mini monasteries. So I got a two thirds up the way and my body said, all right, McBride, that's, that's enough. So I, I, I stopped in a little monastery area and I put my prayer request in the, in the, in the crevices of the little monastery and there were other prayers. Piece of paper folded up. So we're going to do that at the way. We're going to invite you to get some sticky notes that you'll see at the back on these tables and invite you to write at least two things, or it could only be one. One thing that you're saying, I want to leave behind in 2023. Not because there's necessarily shame attached to it, or maybe there is. Not because you see it as a failure, although maybe it may feel like one or be one. But just because you realize there are some things that I could not do in 2023, and I don't want to carry that as a weight. This is the last day. There's about 12 hours left in this year. Don't carry something into 2024 that is left undone when God probably intended for you to not be bound by that day. You just didn't have it to do. And you can look with eyes of faith, intentionality, discernment and balance and say 2024 this is going to be a year where these things become my concrete expression of what time it is what season it is you're joining us online i know you may not be able to do this exact concrete practice but i invite you maybe in your own home make an altar Make a space and just say, I'm going to do this exercise virtually. Or you can put it in the chat if you don't mind sharing publicly, just to be inside there, however you want to do it. But let's do this exercise. I want you to grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. Thank you, Jesus. If you're still writing, feel free to come. We're just going to say a prayer. We're going to bless this offering. 
this declarative expression of our hopes, of our aspirations of those things that we're saying we are bringing to God in faith things that we are leaving in 2023 because we believe that God can handle everything that concerns us. This poem that I'm going to read is thought to be well over 6,000 years old. It was found in a wisdom book in the Sanskrit language, which is a language that predates even our biblical text. It's thought to have been in the Middle East areas of the world, 6,000, 7,000 BC. Wisdom that has lasted over time. I thought it blended well in with the wisdom writer of this particular passage that we've read. It is called, Look to This Day. Obviously it is translated from Sanskrit to English. But this is what it says. I invite you to close your eyes and just listen to the words. It'll be on the screen. We'll leave it on the screen for the rest of our time here today. But these are the words. Listen to the salutation of the dawn. Look to this day, for it is the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the realities and truth of existence, the joy of growth, the splendor of action, the glory of power. For yesterday is but a memory, and tomorrow a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a memory of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. I'm going to read it one more time, at least the last line. For yesterday is but a memory, and tomorrow a vision. But today, somebody say, but today. But today well lived makes every yesterday a memory of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Say it again, so let it be. God, I pray for the person who I'm touching today. God, we want to first say thank you, Lord. You brought us through another year. You brought us through both danger seen and unseen. You brought us through highs and lows, through tears of sadness and tears of joy, through abandonment and being found, through being rejected and being accepted, of winning and losing, of sickness and healing. We say thank you, God. We didn't do everything we wanted to do, but everything that God done, you helped us to do it. And so we say thank you, Lord. We know that the person that I'm touching today is a gift to me in 2023. Our church is a gift. Our community is a gift. Human relationships are gifts. And so I pray for the person who I'm touching today I pray that everything that concerns them will continue to be expressed through the power of your divine love and purpose as we move forward. I pray God for this year to come. Lord, you know their hearts, their imaginations, their aspirations, their dreams. I pray God that you will help them to see an open door 
an open door into the best that you have for them. Healing, peace in our world, hope in our communities, the end of wars and violence and famine and genocides and displacements, the end, oh God, of gun violence in our own communities, Lord God, of police, of community members, of, 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 of partners and women and children and men being harmed by guns and violence and desperation and wickedness and evil intentions. I pray, God, that all of these things, God, will wind down in 2024 and room will be made for life and life abundantly. May we learn to live in time. Whatever season of life you've placed us in, may we look to this day and see it, oh God, as a vision of hope, a well-lived memory of happiness. For this is the day you've given to us. And so we pray as you taught us to pray. Come on, repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Come on, give your neighbor a high five or a hug or elbow bump and tell them, this is our time. This is our time. This is our time. This is our time.